Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears. Let's get into it. We've got a big one for you. We're going to talk about the Trump podcast. Uh, I've got some uh, awesome news about <laughs> this about TikTok's algorithm just de- demoting ugly people, which is sweet. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Royals, the Andrew Tate crypto stuff, and all of the crazy politics shit that's happening over on Twitch. Uh, firstly, though... My neck's feeling better. All right, thank you very much. The neck's feeling better. I can look. I can look right and left now, which is awesome. Um, but dude, I just watched this video that Rosanna Panzino did about the Mr. Beast work chat with uh, Chris Tyson in it. That's uh, coming out. They had this work chat on Telegram. This former employee is like leaking. Uh, I imagine he's going to get sued into oblivion because the, all of the screenshots coming out of this thing is. Just so awesome, right? So uh, they've got Chris Tyson and Mr. Beast just like sharing child porn <laughs> in the fucking group chat. Oh, well, Mr. Beast isn't sharing it, but like Chris Tyson's chucking in images going, oh, so apparently this is uh, this is like uh, Melania Trump when she was 13. It's just like a naked picture of someone who's probably her. I don't know. I haven't seen it, but um, never, never did I think that one day I would log on to YouTube and watch like a a cooking YouTuber with 10 million subscribers go, yeah, she definitely looks 13 <laughs> while looking at like child porn. It's crazy, dude. But Chris Tyson's dropping that in the in the work group chat being like, yeah, look, uh, apparently this is a 13 year old child naked. I don't know if it's real or not. Brother, that's so unbelievably illegal. Sorry, sister. She, her is a pedophile, all right? Not him. Get the pronouns correct when it comes to the pedophile. So that's fucking hectic, right? But basically they're, they're putting this out to say that Jimmy Beast knew that Chris Tyson was a, was a creep uh, because Jimmy said, oh, come as a surprise to me when anyone who looks at any of Chris's online behavior can see that it's exceedingly obvious that they are a little freakazoid. Um, but not only is there that message in there, there's also a message from Jimmy and a bunch of others uh, from Jimmy that is like making jokes about Chris's sexual proclivities, we'll call them. Um, like there's one where uh, Jimmy drops an anime where the love interest is like a 17 year old school kid and the main character, a male, is like 28. Drops it in the chat being like, Chris would love this. Which is like, oh my God. Who the fuck? Are, who, like if, look, if you're, if you're dropping in memes about your mate being a, being a fucking pedophile into the work group chat, <laughs> you need a HR department, but you also need a head check. Like what is going on at the Mr. Beast company? Then they pull up these, uh, these discord messages that have been scrubbed from the internet from the old Mr. Beast discord that was public and open to their child fan base. They had a not safe for work board in there. (laughs) And and they show, they show this like mother, right? Someone's mom has made an account, like a good mother monitoring what their children are looking at online. She joins the Mr. Beast Discord full of kids and then sees this like a not safe for work board where they're just posting porn. And this this beautiful mother goes, hey, and her username is like Nikki's mom or something. Hey guys, um, not really sure if we should have like a not safe for work board on the Mr. Beast subreddit because obviously there's lots of children here. And then Chris goes, oh, what am I, a parent? <laughs> Oh, what? There's porn all over the internet. Why should I be the one to keep it away from children? Oh, if a 12-year-old wants to look at porn, they can just go, go on Pornhub.com. So what's the harm in me showing them pictures of my cock? <laughs> my lady Peters. <laughs> it's not looking good for Mr. Beast. I don't know, man. I just think that... that you know what I think about Mr. Beast? I think that that it's uh, a lucky coincidence that YouTube rewards philanthropy. And I've been, I've, I've said this a few times and I got eaten alive for it on Twitter where I don't think that Mr. Beast is like a good person. I think he's doing whatever will get him the most amount of views 
and the most amount of goodwill. And yes, he's like materially, you know, if we if you want to talk, there's this idea of like material truth, right? Where, and this is often used to kind of help you leave uh, abusive relationships or bad friendships or bad employment situations or whatever, where like someone can not be a bad person, but still hurt you. Do you know what I mean? Like if they, if they create an environment that's harmful to you because they're selfish, right? Uh, the material truth is they are hurting you and that they're not necessarily a bad person. So a lot of, so you, so what you will do is you'll be like, oh, well, I'm going to stay in this relationship because I know that like in their head, they're not thinking, oh, I'm going to make, I'm going to make my boyfriend feel like shit today. But they do that unconsciously without trying to from not doing a lot of things. So it's like, they're not thinking I'm going to, I'm going to steal everything I can from this person because I'm evil but they're also that what's actually happening is like maybe they're not seeing your needs at all, right? So then you go, oh yeah, they're not seeing my needs. That doesn't mean that they're like selfish or they're trying to take everything from me. They're just not aware of things that I need. And like that can be true, but the material truth is you're you're in a relationship with a selfish person. Does that make sense? So what I'm saying is like the material truth of Mr. Beast is he does a lot of good things, but like in his head, he's not like, I want to help people and I want to be a good person. In his head, he's going, I need to get a lot of views. I need to get the most views. I need to run the biggest YouTube channel. I have to get the most views. I need to make sure that my my videos retention is up. Like he's all, all that's going on up in here is, is a fucking autistic guy who's obsessed with the YouTube algorithm and creating the greatest YouTube videos. Even he has said this, he's just obsessed with the algorithm and YouTube, right? And I know blokes that have met this guy and that's all that's going on up in here is what will get the view, what will make them watch longer. He's just thinking about making the greatest YouTube videos ever. And it's a coincidence that YouTube promotes the acts that he's doing, right? So when he cures a thousand blind people, it gets hundreds of millions of views, right? And that's good that those people are getting cured. But what I'm saying is, if one day the YouTube algorithm changed, if there was a glitch in the system and all of a sudden you got rewarded with views for doing evil acts, Mr. Beast, his next video would be, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm boiling 1,000 homeless people alive. Like if YouTube rewarded evil acts, Mr. Beast would be evil. He's not a good person because he likes helping people. He's accidentally a good person because that gets views and he runs a philanthropy channel because it it's like a smoke screen for criticism, which is what we're seeing right now. So like everyone's everyone's starting to realize that this guy had a very questionable uh, friend around and knew about their like weird as fuck behavior with minors and the way that they discussed minors. I'm not going to go as far as to, to definitely call them an outright pedophile, but like they've got a numerous, very, very questionable uh, interactions with minors and discussions about minors, right? And Jimmy absolutely knew about it. And so people are saying like, hey, if he knew about this for so long, why didn't he do anything? Does he also talk about this stuff in private? Like what's going on behind the scenes? And then someone, someone else will be like, um, don't you know that he bought toys for children when it's Christmas time? Okay, cool. So let's just let it all slide then. Um, Mr. Beast actually built a bunch of homes for people living in remote locations. So it doesn't matter that he starved women to death on his game show. Like, that's, like, what I'm saying is I don't think he's an evil person, but I also don't think he's a good person. I think he's a person trying to get as many views as possible by any means necessary, and everything else serves that goal, right? He, like, even the reason why he's selling moldy cheese to 10-year-olds is to fund YouTube videos. The guy is absolutely loaded 
and has so much unbelievable amounts of money, but it's just to make a better YouTube video. And I think what we're going to see is like there, there will be like a natural slow slowing of Mr. Beast growth, which, which happens to every, every company, right? Every business, every idea, like, no matter how successful it is, you eventually slow down because there's, you know, there's, you run out of people. Like how much bigger can Mr. Beast actually get in real life, right? Like he'll get more subscribers, but a lot of those accounts are owned by dead people and are no longer active and stuff like that or people who won't watch him anymore. So if you're talking like actual views of engaged audience, I don't think he has... Like, how much bigger could the guy actually get? Maybe if AI translation gets so fucking good that he he becomes, like, massive in India and all this kind of stuff, but he's kind of already doing that. I feel like he's hitting, he's hitting his ceiling, and if he doesn't implode and rapidly decline, it will just be like a slow, steady decline, and I think that's going to make him go absolutely insane. Because I think the guy has just tied his entire identity and self-worth to whatever analytics show up on his YouTube studio app. And everything else is secondary to that goal. Including, like, running a workplace where employees don't get harmed and, you know, not having freaks around. It's like, it's just not a concern to him at all. I think that he's a very autistic guy who just cares about getting YouTube views and making a good thumbnail and title and having people watch, you know, to 80% retention. And, and, if, and if he has to boil cats alive for a video, he will do it. Like, I'm not saying that he's a bad person. I'm saying that the only reason he's not like going to impoverished nations and skinning an entire village alive is because that wouldn't perform well on YouTube. But if AI takes control of the website and there's a, a glitch in the matrix and for six months you can get views by like beheading people, he would be the best at it. He would be beheading the most people. Like, I don't think anyone would deny that. I don't think that people would be like, no, nah, no, nah, he would. Like if one day... Running over over schools with kids inside them with, with a bulldozer would get more views than feeding the homeless. He would shut down those soup kitchens like that. <laughs> I think what we're seeing is like the very slow, steady eroding of Mr. Beast's public image, and it's all down to who he's associated himself with. You know, you got the Chris Tyson stuff. Now you've got him like working with Logan Paul, that's another like erosion of like, why would you do that other than to, you know, make money despite what this guy's done and working with KSI, the crypto scams and all that kind of stuff. And now you have a look at what's happening with Amazon on his game show where it sounds like they're starving contestants and not giving people the medicine that they need and not getting women like tampons and shit like that while they're filming and allowing men to beat the shit out of women because their physical challenges where it pays to eliminate someone weaker than you. So you've got like giant dudes like me throwing women around half their size. It's like, I think this maybe also is just what happens when you fly too close to the sun. Like, why would you want to be this big as well? Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm in love where I am and where I'm headed. Like, I, I think that I'm going to get a lot bigger, but I, I love that the stuff that I do turns a lot of people off. It's not mass appeal. Like so many people, even like I'm getting millions of views right now, but I'm getting a lot, a lot of those views of people going, oh, I don't like this. It's too, I don't like it. You know, I love that because it means that I'm never going to like, as, and also because I'm a comedian, there's, there's an, a, a natural ceiling for how famous you can get. Like, I don't know, Matt Reif, Kevin Hart, is Kevin Hart's probably the, the biggest 
a comedian has ever gotten, but that's you would almost take him out of the comedian category when it comes to why is he so famous. He's a movie star, right? Stand-up comedians, fuck Louis C.K., Bill Burr, that's as famous as you get. You can still go to the shops, right? I don't, like, to, to be as famous as Mr. Beast, I feel like it just ruins your fucking life, bro. Like, that guy, I don't know if you know this, but he, he essentially runs the economy of a fucking small town where he bases his studio out of. That guy literally buys neighborhoods. He he owns a bunch of houses in one street. He lives in one. His favorite employee lives in another. And so on it goes. Right? He's become so important to the local economy of the town that he sets his studio up in that if he leaves... The town could fucking collapse. That's how many jobs would be lost. Like, why the fuck would you want to do that? The amount of stress that must be going through this guy's mind. You know, like if he doesn't get a one out of 10 on his YouTube studio dashboard, oh, there's going to be hell to pay. There'll be a lot of yelling. I don't know. I just feel like, and, th and that's, that's why he can't smile. That's why when people say smile, he just shows you his teeth. He's not, he's not there. American Psycho was about Mr. Beast. I, I don't think he kills women. But I, but I know for sure that if you could get more views doing that on YouTube, he would. So yes, right now he's a materially good person. But only because that gets views. I got eaten alive for saying that on Twitter a few months ago. Well, 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 look who's right again, Mr. Spears. That's right. It'll be very interesting to see how all of this turns out. I really feel like that this ex Mr. Beast employee that is like, and also the guy like worked there for two weeks. <laughs> Could you fucking imagine? You get, and, and by all accounts, the guy was a fucking terrible employee and a bit of a weirdo as well. Could you imagine getting a guy in for like two weeks, one of seven, 17,000 employees, you get him in there for two weeks, he downloads your entire Discord and calls his boss a pedophile and nukes your entire business? Fuck! <laughs> Who hired this guy? You're fired! What was he even doing here? Did he, does he even know how to edit? Fuck! So funny, dude. So yeah, it'd be very interesting to see what happens. I don't know. I I feel like I feel like we are witnessing the fall of an empire. It's gonna. It's not gonna be quick though. I think it's gonna take a really, really, really long time. Here's what I think is gonna happen. He, he, if I if I rub my crystal ball right, and I might be wrong, but here's what here's what I think is gonna happen. I think that each subsequent Mr. Beast video is is just. I think that he can't top the things that he's already done. I think that he might have another massive banger with the next Squid Games, but that is entirely reliant on does season two of Squid Game have the same impact that season one does? I would argue that it would almost be impossible to do that. There were so many factors around season one that make, it was like a perfect storm. It was like the first like foreign thing that Americans really loved and the whole world really loved. Was that, was it released during COVID as well? I can't even fucking remember. I don't know. I feel like there's a big, there's been a big entertainment dilution. There's so many more streaming services and, and I feel like we're not going to get a cultural moment like Squid Game season one, which means that if we don't get that with season two, we won't get Mr. Beast Squid Game YouTube video like we did with the first one. You understand what I'm saying? I feel like the the big ideas that he used to have and the ideas that he used to be able to pull off, I don't think they're there anymore. So I think there's going to be a steady decline in YouTube spectacle video. I also think culturally on the website, like we're just kind of over those videos of like, hey guys, so that was a bit, 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 bit. we did 10,000, $1 million. I feel like we're over that fucking super edited high retention ADHD brain rot content. People want longer 
better pace stuff. That's why, like, with my YouTube videos, <laughs> here, yeah, here I am going, yeah, like, Mr. Beast doesn't know what he's doing. What he should be doing is, is you know, talking about uh, people addicted to acid for 20 minutes and trashing them, <laughs> like me. But you know what I mean? I, I, the, the minute I slowed my videos down and I made them longer and I, and I made them less, like, edited and I took out the music, I took out the sound effects i took out most of the images i just it's just me and my voice and my jokes the minute i took all that shit out people started being like dude these are so good watching for longer being able to put it on and just kind of enjoy it instead of being assaulted with bang 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 noise 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 cut 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 camera angle all this shit i think this mr b show is going to come out i think it's i don't think it's going to flop but i think people are going to be like oh yeah this isn't as good as his other shit you know? Like this is just like a bigger budget version of, you know, the Squid Games video, which is cool because it was the Squid Games video and because it was on YouTube. Like, are many people... Are enough people going over to Amazon Prime to watch the videos to justify him swinging a Herculean amount of Mr. Beast energy and time into videos that won't get seen on anywhere near the scale of his other videos and probably won't be liked as much because they'll just inherently be more corporate and, you know, too many chefs in the kitchen type scenario. So I think that'll happen. I think that will not be received well. And I just think we're going to witness a very steady, slow decline of the Mr. Beast empire until he's just making videos for 10-year-olds and his views have, like, halved, and that's what it is. That's kind of... You know, I feel like he's clocked it. I don't think he gets any bigger. How can you get any bigger than what he's achieved? What he's achieved is amazing. If I were him, I would just fucking retire, do a PewDiePie, just fucking make some gaming videos and call it a day. But I think that slow, steady decline will send him insane because he'll just forever be chasing the, the 100 million in a day high that he used to get. You know what I mean? I don't know. Anyway, should we talk about the Trump podcast? I listened to I've I've listened to it and look, it's really interesting. This this Trump podcast stuff, Trump on Joe Rogan. Um Yeah, it's really interesting that Kamala Harris has said I think that she's not going to do it, which I think is like the worst possible move. If you want to win the election now, you have to do Joe Rogan. Like, that's actually the world that we live in. you got to do the podcasts. You know what's really interesting about this? I've been seeing this theory all over Twitter, and uh, I it looks to be true. So Trump has been listening to his son, Barron, who I think is 19, and has been listening to Barron and doing the podcast appearances that Barron's telling him to do. Because Barron's, Barron's Gen Z, he's tapped in, he knows what young people care about, he knows what gets uh, a lot of culturally impactful views uh, in a way that, you know, a fucking old man never could. And Trump's been listening and doing it and it's working, right? He did Theo Vaughn. Now that's, if, if an idea came from a Gen Z kid on TikTok, it's do the Theo Vaughn podcast. Theo Vaughn is so fucking big because of TikTok, right? And young men love Theo's podcast and also young women do as well, right? So that's a genius move. Um, JD Vance just did Tim Dillon. That's got to be barren. And now we've got Trump on Rogan. I <clears throat> really feel between him and doing flagrant as well, I think it's all Baron, bro. I reckon Baron's being like, dad, you got to do this, 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 and this. That's going to plug you in with everyone under 30. And that I think is what's going to win the election is whoever can swing the most young people, because it's going to be really close, just like the last one was. Uh, and I honestly think it's going to come down to who did better on long form podcasts because as much as we like to say that you know we like to think of us as being able to like decide an election based on who has the best ideas the best policy that's not how elections have ever been won it's who was the most likable 
the in the month leading up to the the election. Like that's literally what every election from now, from, but well, every election from 2016 to now is and and always will be. It will be who made me laugh the most on my phone the morning before I went to the fucking voting booth. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And right now it's Trump. We've only got a couple weeks until the election and Trump is absolutely killing it on long form interviews. Kamala Harris did call her daddy. I thought that was an amazing move, uh, but she's only doing that, you know? Then she did Howard Stern. Who gives a fuck about Howard Stern? And both of those shows focused on like policy and I felt like all of the answers that she gave were so like scripted and politics political and like she's doing a great job at looking like a politician but you need to do that when you're on cnn you got to do that when you're on fox news which by the way i think she crushed it on fox news she was super strong she really pushed back she didn't let the guy spin her words and spin trump's words she really like stuck a knife into that guy uh crushed it on there but on podcast bro when you're on fucking joe rogan you just have to be like a person you got to be a fallible uh, authentic person. And Trump is one of the most authentic politicians ever. I don't mean to say that he tells the truth and that he's a truthful person. I mean that literally he will tell you that he lies a lot and he will tell you that he makes shit up and he'll tell you that he weaves and waffles. And that's authentic, right? If you call out a guy for lying and he goes, ah, you got me. You're like, ah, you bloody scamp. That's Trump. And that's what he fucking nails it at. And that's why he won 2016, because he was in an election against a politician. Right? Where Hillary Clinton was like, ha, this fucking moron. I actually know what my policies are, and I can communicate that to the public. This guy's not even a politician. There's no way they'll fucking vote for this idiot. And Trump was like, wrong. you be in jail. I just dunked her, owned her. And the reason why I think he lost the, the next election is obviously there was all the COVID stuff and just about every government in the world that went through a lockdown voted out whoever was in charge to get a refresh. We did it in Australia. I think that that was a huge part of it. But I think that the uh, another big part of it was for some reason, Trump gave up on the social media stuff. I think he actually, he, he tried to be a politician and that's not his strong suit. When it, And I'm, I'm purely talking about winning an election here. Don't, don't misconstrue my my uh, praise for his campaigning as my praise for him being the president. I'm purely talking about what's going to win the election here, right? Marketing, basically. Um, he is so much better than every other politician at being a human being and being relatable and being authentic and being identifiable. So many people can look at Trump and be like, that's... You know, that guy's not a fucking politician. He's a bit of a loon. He says some fucking crazy stuff, but I know that he's up there being him. Even when he's telling a lie, even when he's omitting truth, he is being authentically who he is. And when I look at Kamala Harris, I so very rarely see who she is as a person. And I know that that's not what we should be voting on. We should look at ideas and policy and figure out who's going to run the country better. But at the end of the day, humans connect to humans. And if you can't connect to her on a human level, it doesn't matter what her fucking policies is, are. She won't inspire you to go out and vote. And I think that's what Trump is kicking her ass on. And I think that it'll win him the election. At this point, I think that he wins just because of his campaign strategy, which is coming across as so much more authentic. I also feel like, you know, the whole thing with like Kamala Harris is like, she is only recently the nominee. So people are getting used to the idea of that. I feel like people are like looking at Joe Biden and being like, well, fuck man, if Joe Biden was the president for so long and was put forth as the candidate when he obviously wasn't like physically and mentally well enough to do it, who was actually running the show? Why didn't they do this way sooner? Kamala Harris up to the fucking 30 seconds before he was in charge was saying, no, he's totally fine. And he's, 
You know, I feel like there's like a lot of, it reminds me so much of when we did this in Australia, we swapped out prime ministers without elections. You know, we elected a, a woman, they swapped her out. We picked a guy, they swapped him out. Like we went, we went through like fucking 13,000 prime ministers in like two weeks. And all the people, even the people that were, that voted for the party that won, but then they swapped out a leader were like, this is fucking, this is weird. Who's actually running the show? And I feel like that's working against Kamala Harris here. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Joe Rogan podcast was, <laughs> well, it was just classic Trump. Like literally if you watch the first 20 minutes of it, Joe Rogan goes straight in and goes, why do you think the election was stolen? What evidence do you have? And Trump <laughs> talked for 20 minutes. Joe tried three more times. Yeah, but like, give me an example, brother. Give me some evidence. And Trump's like, there's so much evidence. There's lots. And Joe Rogan literally goes, like what? And Trump goes, well, I could give you so much. I, Trump literally goes, I could come back another time and show you documents and documents. And it's like, all right, dude, if you wanted to talk about that, why didn't you bring it? And all, if there's so many documents, surely you could like reference them from memory. I really feel like the Trump's like, oh, I feel like it was stolen, but I can't really explain to you how. <laughs> uh, but that being said, he comes across as like very like likable and authentic and like fun to hang out with. And that wins elections, like it or not, that wins elections. If you can look at a guy and be like, oh, he looks like he'd be like a cool hang. I would like to have a beer with that guy. That guy can win a fucking election. You know? And Trump's really good at that. He's very charming. He's very funny. He's very quick. He's a fucking entertainment professional. The guy's been an entertainer for way longer than he's been a politician. Politicians get to run for president not by being likable, but by doing the right political moves and being very careful with their career. Da, 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 da. This is the first guy that was just like, I reckon I could win because I could make people vote for me. And he fucking did it. And that's a tough opponent. So, yeah, I really feel like Kamala Harris is kind of, kind of making the mistake that I think Hillary Clinton did, which is like going, how could you take this guy seriously? He's not even a politician like I am. I know what my policies are. Am I this? Am I that? And then Trump's like, hey, who wants to fucking hang out with me after I win? Should we go and get a beer? And people are like, dude, that guy drinks beer. I like beer. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's proving himself uh, to be a much better hang than Kamala Harris is. And unfortunately, like it or not, that wins elections. It'll be very interesting to see who wins. At the moment, I'm leaning, I'm leaning Trump. I think... It looks like he'll win, but also who knows? You know? Because as loud as the Trump supporters are, there's just so many people that are just like fucking sick of him and are just like, ugh. Who knows? I think that if Kamala Harris doesn't do Joe Rogan, that's the dumbest, the dumbest decision that their campaign could make. Because tr Rogan... He's not really, he's not, he doesn't grill. Like he's there to kind of make the guest feel comfortable and have a cool chat. Like the only way you're going to make Rogan grill you is if you say weed is dumb, you know, then he'll fucking turn it up to 11 and he'll eviscerate you. But if you just hang out with him and have a, have a chat and have a laugh, like he will make you look very fucking likable. And I think that's how Trump came across, even though he was waffling, even though he was avoiding direct questions, he still had like a great chat and a hang. Like it's, it's Im almost impossible to hide who you are over three hours. Eventually the fucking wall comes down and it's just two blokes having a yarn. And I think if Kamala Harris can do that on Rogan and if she does Rogan well, I'll fucking change my mind and I'll be like, I think she could win. But Especially because, right, Kamala Harris doing Call Her Daddy, that's a cool idea. And that's good for her base. But her base is young women. She's already sold them. Like, they, they're they voting for her. 
She doesn't need to win over young women. They don't. They hate Trump. They're going to vote for her. They like a woman leader. That battle's won, right? Trump should be going on call her daddy to win over those young women. That's what he should be doing, right? To try and win them over. And the same thing, same, same way, Kamala Harris should be doing Joe Rogan to win over, like, men. Because if you can't get men to vote for you, you can't win. And right now, Trump has young men, I think. You look at all these st studies that are coming out, that like the new generation, the young men, they're all leaning much more conservative than women are. That changes the course of history, dude. And if Kamala Harris can't go on Joe Rogan and tell jokes about weed and aliens, she can't win an election, you know? That's what I, that's what I think anyway. That's that's my foreign opinion on the on the state of affairs in America. You know what really really surprised me is I watched the the vice presidential debate. I don't know if I've talked about this before, but fucking dude, JD Vance was like great. I was fully sold on him being an absolute fucking psycho because all I'd seen was like the the uh, Haitians eating pets, which by the way is insanely false and crazy. Uh, but hearing him speak, like, yeah, the guy fucking seems to really give a fuck about America uh, and was great in the debate to the point where Tim Waltz was agreeing with him more than I was. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I just think that they, uh, I yeah, I think that Trump's winning at this point. And I think that the only way that he definitely could have been defeated is if they got him, if they just put Bernie up, but they were never going to do that. Um, anyway, that's that's enough about that. Um, all right, let's talk about me, what I've been up to, hey? And then we've got some more stuff to, to get into. There's, there's chapters on the YouTube video. Um, yeah, I'm feeling a lot better from the last episode. My neck hurts a lot less. It's still there though. Do you know when, you know when like you're, your when you pull a muscle and, and you're like better but your your body's like i'll fucking do it again dude i'll do it again i'm not scared if you do if you do if you do you know one wrong move i'll fuck your week up again <laughs> that's where i'm at where i'm like oh i'm all better but then i'll look i'll look right and up and my and, and i'll have to stop and be like oh fuck you know but other than that i'm, I'm feeling a lot better i've been doing some light calisthenics again You'll be, uh, you'll be very disappointed to hear. But you know what's even more? You know, dude, I don't know what's happening to me. I don't know what's happening to me. I think um, my fucking, my autism has been triggered and I've just gotten into this, into this fucking, it's probably honestly a really good sign for like my headspace and where my mental health is at, where I've just gotten onto this thing where I like, I just want to start learning a bunch of new stuff that I've always wanted to learn. I've always wanted to be able to draw well and I've never been able to do it. Uh, and I've, and even more autistically, I have always wanted to learn the harmonica. And I'm really, really sorry to say that I fought off the urge to buy a harmonica for like a month, bro. For an entire month, there was something in my brain going, you should fucking, you should learn to play the harmonica. And the, the rest of my spirit and soul will go, don't fucking buy a harmonica. You don't want to be the guy that walks around with a harmonica in his pocket. Don't do that. You don't want to be the guy that at a party be like, oh, I actually can play the harmonica. You don't want to be that guy, all right? That's more annoying than a dude who pulls up the fucking guitar at the house party. But I couldn't help myself. And a couple of days ago, uh, the harmonica arrived. I bought one. Not only did I buy one, I also bought some online lessons from a guy, from an Australian guy called Juzzy Smith. And I've spent the last three days since it arrived trying to play single notes. And it's so fucking hard. But I, but I mark my words, brother. I will learn how to play the harmonica well. And I'm, in, I'm really enjoying it. The other day I went out and I bought fucking lip balm because I've been rubbing my lips on the harmonica so much that they're becoming chapped. I'm going to have a callus on my fucking lips, brother. You know, running my mouth up and down the harmonica for like 15 minutes gave me a lot more respect for women. 
It's tough. I get it now. Three minutes of trying to play the scales, the pentatonic scale on my harmonica. I thought I'm not I'm not built for sucking dick. I got a lot of respect for you ladies. After three minutes of trying to play the pentatonic scale on my harmonica, I knew that I'm not cut out for sucking cock. And look, I'll go down on a girl. I love that. That's good fun. I, in fact, I would like to say that I'm very good at it. I'm somewhat of an expert. I've got rave reviews. Okay, so I'm no stranger to those types of oral activities. Now, I thought that I would imagine that it would be a, a little bit similar in terms of effort expenditure, different motion, but I'm talking effort expenditure. No. If, if trying to play the harmonica is anything to go by, I would not survive if I were captioned, cap, captured, if I were, if I were captured by the Spartans. I would not survive. So I'm really sorry in advance, but at like at some point, one of these days on a podcast, I will bust out the harmonica and you'll be like, fuck, he's pretty good. I hope he doesn't do this every episode. And I might. Anyway, this episode is sponsored by manscaped.com. Use code 20spears for 20% off and free shipping on your order. Dude, they sent me the new beard trimmer. Because previously they've just done like uh, ball bag trimmers. And I've used that on my face, dude. The the new beard trimmer they sent me is unbelievable. It's so good. I don't know if you can tell, but like have a look at the line that they've got on my on my jawline, which is something that I've been trying to do a lot, even with my um razor blade shaver. I've never I've never gotten such a solid lineup on my face before. Uh, but with this thing, first time I used it straight out of the box, it's great. So I highly recommend it. Manscaped.com, use code 20SPEARS um, for the Chairman Pro. Anyway, um, should we read the male or female copy? Um, let's go with, uh, here we go, Chairman Pro male November ad copy. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped, the global leader in men's lifestyle and grooming. Every man knows the unbeatable feeling of a fresh barbershop shave. Now, what if I told you that you no longer have to wait weeks or even months between appointments to experience it? Introducing Manscaped's latest release, the Chairman Pro Package. The all-in-one set contains everything you need to recreate the luxury of a professional shave at home. Whether you're after that daily silky smooth finish or prefer to maintain a rugged 5 o'clock shadow, the Chairman Pro Package has, has you covered. Head over to manscaped.com and, and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using code 20SPEARS for 20% off and free shipping. Talking points. Do not read. Host to talk about a time when he nicked his face using another face razor or share a funny shaving story. How has Manscaped helped your confidence? What do you like about the Chairman Pro package? Good suggestions from the do not read section of the copy. Um, okay, yeah, I used to uh, I used to use the um, the this other beard fucking trimmer that I had and it would always pinch me and cut me and it would give me acne because it would scratch up my face and I've got very sensitive skin. You probably noticed I got a pretty red face. I've got very sensitive skin. My brother's got real bad eczema and I think, I don't know, something going on with the skin in the Spears family. My dad has real bad acne scarring. We've got sensitive skin, right? So I would use I would use this other shaver. It would pinch me and then my skin would flare up. So I tried disposable razors and those were good, but I don't think I look good with like super clean shaven face. So now I've tried this Chairman Pro thing. It got all of the hair off my neck and really lined up my beard properly. I haven't used the, the multiple length trimming because I, on a whim, using a safety razor, got rid of all my hair and now it's growing back. But I've been really trying to figure out how to keep like maybe an extra two days of growth on my face. So after this, I'm going to use it. And that, But I think that's what it's for is you can make it look like, you know, you've uh, like stubble is what I want. And I've never been able to do that, but it looks like I can do that with this thing. So anyway, manscaped.com, use code uh, spear, 20 spears for 20% off and free shipping. Um, this, uh, 
situation going on with Twitch is really interesting. Um, and I have some thoughts about it, right? What I think is going to happen uh, going forward. So uh, obviously the, the Israel-Palestine stuff is like still going on and still and getting worse, really, you know? I saw, I saw Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, look, I don't want to praise the man, but I, I went and I listened to uh, the podcast that he did with uh, Lex Friedman right, where Lex was basically just just <laughs> gave him the most softball interview ever, asked no qu qualified, clarifying questions and didn't put him under hot coals at all, just let the guy propagandize, which is really funny when you're having le leaders of state on, um, right? I guess that's why so many politicians are doing podcasts because they just know that just about anywhere they go will be a fucking softball interview and a, and a hangout with the bros and it makes anyone... Like anyone who does any podcast kind of looks good unless they're actually a fucking idiot and they shoot themselves in the foot. It's very rare for a podcast host to make their guest look bad. It's usually the guest <clears throat> makes themselves look bad. But anyway, I listened to Benjamin Netanyahu on the Lex Friedman podcast and I kind of got nothing out of it in terms of like what I, what I, like it didn't change my mind or what I think about the guy at all. Um, I still kind of think he's like a warmongering like maniac. However, bro. I don't want to I don't want to praise Benjamin Netanyahu, but that guy has an incredible voice. Like listening to that guy for an hour was very soothing. Like for a guy who loves to shell school children from orbit, he has a very relaxing voice. Like I'm not really a fan of of his uh gentrification. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> I'm not really a fan of his genocidal work, but I am. A, but if he narrated audiobooks, I would listen. You know, like when it, when it comes to you know being in charge of destroying a culture, he's nailing that. But I think his true calling would be to to narrate like a sleep app. Like I would listen to that. You know, I would. I would. You know, even with all this, all of the horrific war crimes he's committed. If he came out and released an audiobook, I would listen to it, not because I'm interested in what he has to say, but I'm very interested in how he says it. That man has, has one of the, the most amazing voices, speaking voices of all time. Honestly, I challenge you to have a bad time listening to him talk on a podcast. You know? I bet, I bet even a bunch of Palestinians would agree that, like, this guy, I really don't like his... His, uh, his work above us with the drones, but I tell you what, if that guy if that guy read me a bedtime story, I would sleep well. <laughs> but but anyway, so what's happened with the uh, with the Israel Palestine? Obviously, it's like it's taken over Twitch because Twitch's biggest streamers uh, is is one of the biggest streamers is uh, Hassan Piker, right? He's he's one of their big dogs. And obviously, he's very, very vocal uh, against Israel and pro-Palestine. And he's had a lot of really controversial people on. He's had, he's had a, this young kid who a lot of people are just saying that he's like an outright like terrorist pirate Houthi, right? Uh, Hassan's done a lot of uh, – had, had him on his stream and hung out with him and, and really promoted the guy. Um, but a lot of people think that this guy is like actually just, you know, a really terrifying um, anti-Semitic – terrorist pirate guy right now whatever you think of, about that the point that i'm trying to get to is it's really really bad for twitch because twitch is making no money it's an unbelievably expensive website to run and the only way that they can make money is with ads right now ethan klein who's a jewish guy uh has kind of come out and really rallied against several very big Twitch streamers that cover politics and has come up with the accusation that they're all very anti-Semitic. They've uh, posted and talked about horrific things. Like there was one one woman, and this is his allegations. Um, this one woman, she's come out and said that she hopes that American soldiers get PTSD. That's not exactly what she said. What she actually said was um, the war in the Middle East was terrible and it never should have happened which i agree with uh and also which most fucking soldiers agree with as well uh going into 
those places was based on mostly half truths and we didn't accomplish anything that we thought that we would. Uh, and we ended up leaving and, and losing basically, you know, who's in charge, the fucking Taliban. They're literally the government there. Right. But anyway, um, she came out and the full quote is something along the lines of if a soldier came back from the middle East and said, Oh, it was a mistake to have gone there. I feel terrible for what I did. We never should have been there in the first place then that's fine. But if a soldier comes back and is proud of what they did and is happy that they went there, then fuck them. I hope they get PTSD is essentially what she said. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the spirit of what she said. Uh, so she's been banned from for, for this because uh, it violates like the hate speech terminology on Twitch because there's like uh, there is uh, veterans are a protected class on Twitch. So it's like being, it's up there with being racist or discriminatory based on disability and all that kind of stuff. Veteran status, that's a protected class on Twitch. Uh, not uh, in America. If you're a veteran, you, you're allowed to just be a homeless drug addict and no one looks after you. But on Twitch, they won't let you say, I hope you, <laughs> they won't let you say mean things about you. So that's good. Um, but anyway, what I'm getting to is there's been this huge controversy of like, Oh, is Twitch allowing anti-Semitism to run rampant, or is Twitch, uh, uh, or, or are these streamers just anti-Zionist? Are they just anti-Israel's policies, but not anti-Jewish? And that whole debate and all that kind of stuff. Now, regardless of what what you think the actual answer is, this whole question being posed at all is really bad for Twitch because. BMW is not going to put their ads on the platform where everyone's arguing about whether or not they're anti-Semitic. You know what I mean? Regardless of what the truth is, if the question is being asked loudly and often enough, I'm not going to put my fucking ads for Coke on your platform. And so Twitch's biggest creators being political and discussing war is horrible for their business but they can't obviously ban them because they're not violating the guidelines and also that would look even worse like sorry you can't discuss genocide and tragedy and and war at all on our platform but also I don't see a way that the business can become profitable or sustainable if their biggest creators are talking about war and death and genocide and unbelievably controversial topics. It reminds me so much of the adpocalypse. Like, remember when uh, all these people kind of exposed that advertisements and advertisers, their products were being run next to content that was really political or uh, at least uh, arguably racist or anti-Semitic and all that kind of stuff? All these advertisers pulled their ads from YouTube and YouTube had to completely change the rules and how ads worked and all this kind of stuff. And all these people got demonetized and lost their platforms. And it was a really rough time for the website. I think it's come out of it. And I think it's come out better for it, but only because the biggest creators on YouTube are people like fucking Mr. Beast who are creating challenge videos and vloggers and musicians and such a variety of content and stuff like that. Whereas on Twitch, like, yeah, bro, the one of the biggest voices who is constantly referenced, like the guy is a political streamer that talks about horrific shit every day. Not that he shouldn't, right? I actually, you know, I, I enjoy him from time to time. There's a lot of stuff I disagree with that he says, but also I love that someone is doing that, right? But I can also recognize that business-wise, horrible for the business. You know, like you can't come to Coca-Cola and be like, oh, you know, you should advertise on our website. And they'll be like, okay, who are your biggest creators? And I'll be like, oh, this guy. And they open up the stream and he's got a fucking, a guy who's ever, <laughs> they've got a Houthi on. You know what I mean? Like you can't have a guy who's uh, who's got videos on his Twitter of him shooting an AK-47 and talking about putting Zionists on a stake, spearing them, killing them, right? That's literally what this kid's done. And his son's like, yeah, let's have him on the stream. He likes One Piece. Coca-Cola is going to be like, yeah, I'll give it a miss. I'd rather be on kick. <laughs> and you couple that with like how expensive it is for Twitch to host anyone. Like YouTube is expensive enough and they're just hosting video. Like a live streamer who's getting like three views is costing the website thousands and thousands of dollars a day. Right? 
And how long can Hassan Piker pay those bills? Not long enough. So I feel like Twitch, especially because it's owned by Amazon, is going to have to make some really tough decisions soon in terms of what they want their website to be. And it might be like a huge cost-saving measure might unfortunately be you have to apply to stream, which is awful and not good for creators. But like, you know, if you jumping on and starting a stream where you get two viewers and you do that for fucking two years, if that costs Twitch like hundreds of thousands of dollars, they can't afford that. So maybe they'll move to a model where like you have to apply to be able to stream. Like someone like me, I could stream because I've got half a million on YouTube or whatever, so I can stream. But like if you don't have a platform on other social media uh, websites that you can direct an audience towards on Twitch, you're not allowed to stream there. Um, and come to think of it, that actually might be good for streamers too, because so many people start streaming and think they're going to become a big streamer by streaming, but you're actually not. You're going to become a big streamer by posting clips and putting up other video content. It's like, I'm not going to sell a fuckload of tickets by being the greatest stand-up comedian alive. I'm going to sell a fuckload of tickets by having a giant online audience. And you can be the best comedian in the world, but if you're the best guy and no one knows about it, you can't sell tickets. It's similar to that. Um, so yeah, very, I don't know, it's it's really interesting. But also like the whole Ethan Klein thing, that guy's having a fucking meltdown, huh? I think that streaming is just so unbelievably unhealthy for the human mind. And there's only a few people that seem to be able to do it without going fucking crazy. And while seeming to be like a normal person, Hassan Pike is one of them. Like whatever you think about his opinions, he seems to be like a relatively normal guy in like one-on-one -on -one situations who doesn't seem to be fucking insane and pulling his hair out. Every other streamer who's live that long, it seems to make them go insane. Right? You look at fucking what Asmongold's just done. The guy can't clean his house. He's fucking insane. You look at what's happened to Ethan Klein since he started streaming. He seems way less happy. He looks super stressed. He looks fucking miserable. Making a lot of money. That's cool. But the guy looks like it's ruined his fucking life. I don't think we're supposed to do that at all. Can you name a streamer that's like a normal person that, that also goes live for more than fucking two hours a day. Kai Sinat is like one. He seems to be relatively normal. Speed is another as well. They seem relatively normal, but like fucking, dude, everybody else who's straight, it seems to be like the number one way to make you unbelievably mentally unwell is to be live and have instant audience feedback from tens of thousands of people for eight hours a day, every day. I think that turns you fucking mental. How could you not go crazy if you don't have a, have a moment to yourself where it's just you and your thoughts? I've I've tried streaming. It's so hard. I streamed all through COVID. I think I was like, I could only do it like a couple times a week. I was like, oh yeah, I'll just get on like five days a week for six hours. I like playing video games anyway. I'll be live. I've done radio before. Uh, I've, I do podcasts. Um, I've done meet and greets. I can go back and forth with people for a long time, dude. I couldn't go for more than like four hours without just starting to completely burn out. And that was one stream, you know? And then the next day, like in my personal life off camera, I would be fucking drained and exhausted. And it was fun. This, this, these were streams that I liked. I liked doing it, but fuck, it took everything out of me. And I just, I just, whenever I think about streaming and I see people that are live for fucking six to eight hours, I just think, dude, how does that not, destroy your soul and you look at what ethan's going through he looks horrible very very mentally frazzled and it's not good for you and you couple that with like i don't know how hassan piker does it like doing that and playing video games sent me nuts or drained me a lot if i was doing that and looking at fucking war footage for fucking eight hours a day and talking politics and having people who 
disagreed with me or hated me or was showing me the next horrible thing of the fucking minute live for eight hours a day. I would go fucking crazy, dude. I think you need to be a very special type of autistic to be able to handle that. And I don't have it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. What do you think about the future of Twitch? I think this politics stuff is is really, really bad for the business of it. And I don't know what the solution is. Um, especially when like the biggest streamers, like people like Speed are kind of popping up on YouTube and not Twitch, you know? Um, I don't know. We should maybe move on from this. Um, in my world again, I mean, copping a lot of flack for the, uh, the, the anti-royal stuff. What's just so interesting because literally the, the biggest thing I've ever done is like the, or one, maybe the vaccine thing, but the second biggest thing I've done is the Prince Philip bit where I, like everybody knows that. So whenever I post jokes or anti-royalist sentiment, I'm always so surprised. I get, I get comments so often from people being like, oh, you've changed or, oh yeah, you've fucking gone woke. And it's like, I'm sorry, what the fuck is woke about not wanting to be ruled by a king that doesn't live in your fucking country? What is woke about that? Can you explain that to me? I don't want to be ruled by someone that does not fucking live here. And the, all the pro-royalist arguments I've been seeing always say, oh, they don't do anything. Like, they don't even actually rule over us. It's mostly symbolic. You know, they haven't actually used any of their powers. So it's like, okay, so we agree. They're fucking useless. Let's get rid of them. Why do we deal with this? Why, why when they visit, do we spend millions of dollars of taxpayer money on fucking security and political visits and all this kind of bullshit to meet up with what is essentially a fucking tourist attraction for England? They do nothing for us. And Lydia Thorpe coming out and interrupting his speech. Well, she didn't even interrupt it, by the way. He gave a speech to Parliament and Lydia Thorpe, who's an elected senator, by the way, an elected politician, rather. She's been elected by us to make, uh, to represent us and to voice her opinions and shit. Now this fucking king who wasn't elected, who he, it's his first time visiting here since becoming king of us. He doesn't fucking live here. He doesn't give a fuck about us. He comes over, does absolutely nothing for our country and uh, denies Lydia Thorpe's request to raise the issue that she cares about with him in person, politely. He said no. So what choice does she have but to interrupt and yell out and make her voice heard? And then the fucking king escorts an elected official out of our parliament, a place we voted her to be in. We didn't vote him in. She gets removed by the fucking king. This is medieval shit. And then people think, people come at me and they go, oh, the royals don't even use their power. He just fucking removed an elected official from parliament for voicing her opinions and for advocating for indigenous people who are Australian. The cunt is English. He's not elected. He's a fucking king. Why do we deal with this? And by the way, the concerns that she voiced were, can you please return the stolen bones of my ancestors that were stolen and smuggled out of the fucking country? Do you know what bones and skulls she's talking about? William Crowther, a Tasmanian politician, sneak, snuck into a morgue, beheaded a fucking Aboriginal elder and snuck the skull out and shipped it off to England in secret. Right? And they've still got it. How is it woke to be like, hey, can you please return the fucking skull that was smuggled out of our country? That's an Australian. It should not be in England. Give it back. And people are like, oh, she should have been polite. They've got bones, brother. They fucking stole a skull. And also... Indigenous people and politicians have been politely requesting the skull and bones of their ancestors to be returned, and they've been politely ignored. So what fucking other option is there? Especially when the king comes to parliament and says, no, I don't want to hear from you. What other option does Lydia have? She's an elected official. She's indigenous herself. She represents people who voted her in to raise these issues. She got voted in because she's very vocal, because she's very disruptive, because she's unapologetic and fucking loud. And she does what 
uh, she believes to be correct and right, even when it rocks the boat. That's what she's there for. That's why she's been elected, right? And she's done exactly what people who voted for her wanted her to do. What's the issue? Well, because he's a royal, we have to show respect. Why? The guy is literally a pedophile harboring freak who is in charge of England because his ancestors killed enough people to be in charge. And yes, sure, they've done a lot of good things and it's cool that we have electricity here, but do you know who fucking built all of that shit? People go, oh, the without, without the royals, they wouldn't be in Australia. They built this country. You know who fucking built it? Convicts, dude. Slaves. All right, it was built with fucking slave labor. Prisoners held against their will, shipped from England to Australia. They're the ones who built the fucking country. And and by the way, the only w- w- way they were able to build, for some reason, was to absolutely fucking genocide Aboriginal and Indigenous people and steal their babies from them and then assimilate them and turn them white. That was official policy. So I don't know why it's woke to be upset that some English guy wearing a fucking crown full of jewels stolen from other countries. I don't know why it's woke to not want to be ruled by some guy who doesn't even fucking live here. Is that woke to want to be represented by people that you voted for? Like, is that lefty nonsense to not want to live under a fucking king? That's who does nothing for us, by the way. I don't know. It's so funny that like, and you know that all of those fucking people as well that like call people who don't like the royals like woke lefty people, you know that they fucking love Trump and shit like that. And you know that they love America and you and and they love this like reactionary right-wing American shit. And those people are the most anti-royalist people ever. They had a whole fucking revolution. They tipped the tea into the water as they fucking should have. They would look at you defending the royals like you're a fucking idiot. Like, why the fuck would you want a king? That's gross. That's pathetic. Why would you want to be ruled? Yuck, dude. So any, yeah, I don't know. Is that woke, brother, to to not want to have a king and queen that that visit once and don't care about our country at all how's how's queen camilla meeting up with she she went she went to meet up with like uh domestic violence experts to talk about that cuz apparently she cares about that uh meanwhile a bunch of like the main domestic violence advocates and charities and organizations were like yeah we weren't invited we didn't know anything about this so it was super selective And also, she invited the fucking Prince Andrew to her coronation. So it's like, do you really care about that or is it all just fucking PR? That's what shits me about the royals. They don't do anything. They're just just trying to make sure that they don't get their fucking property seized. You know? And you know what's also crazy? About the king kicking a politician out of our parliament? Did you know that in England, the royals are not allowed to step foot in their version of parliament? They're not allowed to go in there. Because they separated the fucking royals. Whereas in Australia, we're so fucking uh, stuck in our bent over, subjugated culture that we've not only allowed and welcomed in a royal into our fucking parliament house when he can't even do that in his own country. We've also allowed him to use his power to kick an elected official out. I don't know. I just think it's like fucking pathetic. And I think that it's just uh classic um tall poppy esque Australian culture. Like Australians love to call themselves larrikins and rebels and we like Ned Kelly because he was like oh rebellious and all this kind of stuff. But the minute anyone actually breaks the rules People just love to get on their fucking knees and lick the boot of whoever's in charge. Um, actually, you can't. Th- that's there's a rule for that. You can't break that rule. We are we are so fucking subjugated culturally as Australians. We have such a horrific like prison culture in this country that 
is like convict culture rather where we were mostly convicts and then we're no longer convicts. We're technically free. But the minute anyone starts to stand out or make something of themselves or breaks rules or does something that's uh, a no-no, everyone will fucking band together and try and cut them down and be like, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. And you know what that is? That's like, dude, don't draw attention to us. We'll all get in trouble. If you if you stand out, you'll get all of us in trouble. We don't want the guards looking at us. Like, it's literally convict culture shit. So, and you, everyone in Australia knows this. And in England, it exists to an extent as well, but it's so much worse in Australia. If you're trying to do anything special, if you're trying to be great, if you're trying to create something, if you're trying to stand out, you know the fucking backlash and the evil eye that falls upon you from other Australians. It's a really gross thing that permeates in our culture and it's often celebrated as like, oh, we're keeping people in check. We're we're stopping people from getting big egos and we're making sure people don't get too big for their boots. And it's like... It's not that at all. It's actually just fucking cutting down people that are trying to make something of themselves. And that's why anyone who gets good at fucking anything in their field leaves this country because we actually resent people for trying and standing out. And it's such a problem. And people who are good at things are not better than other people, but they often get treated like they think they are better than other people because they want to try at anything. And it's really gross. And uh, it's a a huge reason why I feel so good when I'm out of this country. I love Australia. And I have some very close friends that I really love. But fuck, we have a poisonous culture when it comes to trying. Uh, And breaking rules that aren't even laws, like just breaking cultural rules or norms and shit like that. I don't know. Yeah. Thoughts? Comment down below. Um, all right. I want to do, uh, I want to get into some emails here. If you want to send an email to the show, if you have, if you need some, if you have some life advice questions, if you want to tell me a story, if you have something you think that I would enjoy, if you want to know my thoughts on something, send it through to podcast at loosebeers.com. Dot com. All right, what do we have here? I went to a concert by myself because of your con- podcast. Uh, hey, Lewis, I've been a fan of you since I was like 12. Lol, that's no good, is it? <laughs> I'm now 19, probably the weirdest 19-year-old out. Also, before I start, I just wanted to say that I uh, that during lockdown, I started binging the Luke and Lewis podcast, and that really helped me get through what was quite a rough period in my life. So thank you for that. Man, it got us through a rough period as well. COVID fucking sucked, but doing Spearhead Sundays, doing Luke and Lewis, it fucking got me through COVID just as much as it got a lot of you guys through it as well, you know? Um, Now, I'll start with a bit of backstory, but feel free to skip this paragraph if you want to, uh, because when I'm on Ritalin, I tend to yap a bit. Uh, All right, yeah, I'm skipping it. All right, all right, backstory over. Uh, One of the first, one of the few friends I have left agreed to go and see The weekend with me back in August. So I booked tickets in the pre-sale and literally a few hours later, she was like, sorry, I talked to my mom and we decided that I can't afford to go. Um, I told her, uh, all right. I spent the next few months leading up to the concert trying to find someone else. Almost got somebody, but obviously didn't end up uh, happening. I was either going to sell the ticket or give them to my sister. But since I've been listening to your podcast for the last six months, I decided to take your advice and go by myself. Love that. At first, I was anxious. Oh, bro, speaking of this, the Coldplay concert is next weekend. I'm going by myself. I'm so excited. Um, All right. So I went by myself. Um, I And I was really able to enjoy myself. I also made a point of not filming the concert and all, and I just spent the concert living in the moment. Yes, brother. I see what you were talking about when saying that like it's saying saying it that it's so nice not having to worry about anyone else. Getting home was a was a horrific mess. They made a human funnel at the train station, but it would have been 10 times harder trying not to get separated from someone. Ultimately, this has been a great learning experience and it's all thanks to you. This year, I made a friend who's a fan of you, so ideally I won't be seeing you by myself. Yeah, you have to going going by yourself to things is great, but you know what's but you don't want to do that to my shows. You want to bring 10 friends. <laughs> um, I thought you would like to know that you've successfully converted me to a person who's able to enjoy going to things by themselves. Also, just wanted to say I'm loving the return of YouTube and the real talks. 
The YouTube is how I became a fan in the first place. So it's great to see you back at it. And the videos are really funny. Thank you so much, dude. That's awesome. I love, I love that. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta give yourself permission to enjoy things, man. Like there's you, I think like, uh, what you really realize is no, no one's fucking looking at you and no one's thinking about you very much at all. Uh, and so when you're, especially when you're at a concert, dude, when you're there by yourself, no one can tell you like that you're a crowd, right? Like if, if there's 10 seats in a row and everyone's a stranger, if the 11th person, person, person comes and looks at the row of 10 seats, they don't know who's friends especially if you're just fucking sitting there and like nodding your head, enjoying the music or laughing at the show. Like no, it's so not embarrassing to go to things by yourself. It feels weird doing it, but only because you've never done that before. Um, yeah. I, I love that dude. That's awesome. Um, anyway. Okay. I'm going to do one more email. Then we'll probably get out of here. Hey, Lewis, I can't believe I found out Liam Payne died through a Lewis Spears tweet. I can't believe I then showed my girlfriend, massive One Direction fan, before realizing she also didn't know. I'm writing this from the couch. <laughs> uh, firstly, your podcast uh, and comedy has got me through 2024. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, it's been a tough year and you made it better. Thank you. Uh, no worries, buddy. Like I say, doing this podcast, it's good for me as well. Um, anyway, uh, I'm feeling pretty stuck in life. I turned 21 in January and I feel like I've wasted the year. I started a food bank charity to help my community this year. Man, that doesn't sound like a waste at all. I quit my job at another charity December last year with the goal of getting a new charity closer to home up and running. Long story short, we only just opened our doors seven weeks ago. It's been the longest year of my life with everything imaginable going wrong. Despite the fact that the charity has opened and has helped people, I feel like I've wasted the year and I'm stressing over money when I've never have done so previously. I've worked on this charity full time since December and only in the last few weeks got a weekend job to gain some cash. I look at my partner and my friends who all have stable jobs and a decent income and I feel left behind. Eventually, I hope to take a very small wage from the charity once I can afford uh, to buy, uh, once it can afford to buy in the... Uh, I hope to take a very small wage from the charity once it can afford to. In the meantime, I feel like I'm failing as a human. What would be your advice for people in their early 20s with finances? I know it's not the be and end all, uh, but society tells us otherwise. Hoping you may have some advice. Uh, to make matters worse, once my partner stopped crying over Liam, I showed her a picture of you. She snatched the phone, zoomed in on the chin, and now she's left me and is moving to Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, she's she's just sitting on the couch off camera. Say hello. Hi. Um, yeah, look, you are, you're 21, dude. And it sounds like you're doing a lot more than fucking most other people at 21. You, you're running your own fucking charity. That's awesome. You're working towards making a living out of helping people. That's fucking incredible. You're not meant to have money when you're fucking 21, dude. I'm 30 now, and you guys all know this. I'm very broke. Money comes and goes. It ebbs and flows. Like every single person that I know that has a fuckload of money has gone through multiple periods of being broke, getting there. And even after, I mean, I've had a lot of money before and I have lost it all, you know, from getting sick. Not all, you know, I'm, st I'm still, I'm, I'm buying food and I haven't lost the house. Thank God. But yeah, I'm fucking, I'm like the, all this year and really all the last three years, I've been drowning in bills and falling behind on the mortgage and stressing about how I'm going to buy food and getting fucking emails, threatening the, the power to get turned off. We, uh, we had the internet turned off at least four times over the last three years because I couldn't pay the bill. Um, and that's, you know, because shit went wrong. I got sick. I had to go through surgeries. I couldn't work properly. And I feel like only just now I'm slowly getting some momentum back up. Like I've actually made some fucking money on YouTube this month. Uh, I made, uh, this month I've made what? $4,000 on, on YouTube. Right. And that's, uh, the most amount of money I've made in a month off YouTube, literally for three years, right? It's before that it's been like one or $200. Like, I don't know how the fuck I've managed to keep the house and buy food for so long. I've been really struggling, but I, you have to realize that 
success is a lagging indicator. Do you know what I mean? Like when I was 21, I was dirt broke. I had no idea that I would be making enough money to buy a house before I was 30. Like that's fucking crazy. And as much as I would think, oh, I'm so stressed about money. I got to, I have to remind myself like, fuck, not only am I a homeowner, right? I also have like crazy earning potential because of YouTube. Like YouTube is a place where, yeah, I might make $200 a month for fucking two years. Like I have been, but I also know that if I can really figure this out, I could be making $20,000 a month. I've never done that before, but I know if I actually focus on me and do what a lot of my much more successful YouTube peers have been doing, that's what I could be making. Um, and really, it's like, I've always found that that stressing about money and trying to make money and I have to make money, that's one surefire way to actually not make any money and fucking run out. Every time I've done things where I'm like, I got to make money. I have to make money. I'm, I'm trying to do, that's when I've made like the worst fucking decisions ever um, where it hasn't worked out or where it's eluded, eluded me. Whereas if you really want to make money, you just got to do something really well, right? So if you can run this fucking charity really, really, really well, eventually if you are actually genuinely looking at problems and solving them, it will work and it will pay off and you'll be able to take a wage from it. Um, and you will make money, you know? I was broke as fuck when I was 21. I remember I started this when I was 18 and then I started stand-up when I was 19 or 20 maybe. Uh, and I think my memories are foggy, but you can listen, you can listen to me go through this process on the podcast. I think when I was 22, I left my job uh, at the call center and then I ran out of money in six months and then I had to go crawling back uh, and I was there for another eight months and I felt like a fucking failure. I'm like, oh my God, I failed. I'm never going to make it. I, I tried to leave my job and it didn't work and I ran out of money and I had to get another job, blah, blah, blah. And then fucking eight months after that, I left that job again and I haven't gone back. I've been without a job for 10 years. This is my fucking dream. And I've had huge ups and downs, you know, like during COVID, I made an obscene amount of money. So much, I've never seen so much money in my fucking life from cryptocurrency and YouTube and brand deals and this and that. And, uh, and then I've never made, uh, less money over the last couple of years. And I've never spent so much money on the mortgage and on my surgeries and on, uh, you know, debt and all this other kind of, all this other shit that, that came about from me being really sick and making a lot of poor decisions, uh, because I was ill and I wasn't able to think things through and I was desperate to trying to make money. Um, and now I feel like I'm at a place where I'm like, okay, well, you know, I just, if I make really good, funny YouTube videos, and if I make the podcast really, really good, people will watch the videos and they will get views and I will get a podcast that people listen to every week and those people will appreciate what I'm doing and they'll contribute on Patreon and the Patreon will grow and that will get me out of it. But like that could all go away if I stopped thinking about making good, valuable, funny stuff and started thinking about, oh, all right, how can I, how do I make as much money as possible? You know, because you guys will be like, oh, this guy just wants to milk us for fucking money, which, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, once you pay your bills and can buy food, money doesn't do much for you. Uh, like for me, I want to buy food and pay my bills. And then after that, I would like to buy nice, healthier, fresh food. And I would like to have like cool clothes, but like not an obscene amount of clothes, you know, that's kind of it. Um, and the more you realize that you're actually not supposed to have money in your twenties, the happier you, you will be. And also 
I can tell you from experience, like as someone who has been very broke and then who has had a lot of money and then who has been very broke, it ebbs and it flows. And also when you have a fuckload of money because you've made a business, a lot of that money you don't actually get to spend. You don't actually get to keep it. It's like a lot of money is floating around and changing hands. And like, I managed to buy a house and that's amazing, but it's in the house and I don't get to like, money is just energy and it comes and it goes. And if you can do something really fucking well and bring value to other people, money will follow that. And it doesn't matter anywhere near as much as you think it does. And that being said, if you have nothing, it matters fucking heaps, you know? Once you have your basics covered, it's it just it's just a thing. It's just a number in your fucking phone app and it doesn't make you happier. It's cool to be able to do things and it, it makes your life a lot less stressful. But having... I mean, I've never seen a million dollars in my bank account, but like having a million dollars in your bank account, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't make you happy. It removes a lot of stresses, but it doesn't, but like, yeah, the, what I'm saying is the difference between like having a hundred thousand dollars in your bank versus a million dollars in your bank, it doesn't, it's almost zero. You know, it doesn't change anything. Because once your bills are covered and once you're buying nice food uh, and once you are like engaging in whatever your hobby is and you're not really limited with money, like every dollar after that is like, I don't give a fuck. Why, that doesn't affect my life at all. It's just a number. Um, but th that's that's my perspective is, you're, is yeah, you're, you're actually supposed to be broke in your fucking 20s, dude. Right? Like... If, like, really honestly ask yourself, if you had a million dollars in your bank account, would you blow it? Yeah, you would. You'd fuck it up. If someone gave me a million dollars when I was 21, I would be I would be broke in, like, fucking eight months. And I, you know, you're not supposed to have money in your 20s. You're supposed to figure it out. And this is all a normal part of it. Uh, and you shouldn't be chasing money. You should be chasing doing a job really well. And whatever your thing is, doing that really well and providing value to other people. If you can't provide value, you you won't be able to make money. Money's energy and it follows what you put out. You know? That those are my thoughts. You're doing great. You're running a fucking business, man. I know it's a charity, but that's a business, right? So, focus on that. And yeah, you will have to eat shit and have another job and be broke as fuck for a long time, but fuck dude, if I, I worked in call centers while I was trying to do stand up and trying to make the online thing work and I hated it and, and I left my job and then I came back to the job and I felt like I failed. It's all part of the, the process. Where I'm at now is I know that like, I think I'm turning things around. Uh, the YouTube is working. I think that if I can do that for a year, I will be fine. But I'm, you know, I'm in a precarious position. Like I could lose it all in four months. Um, but I also know that like, okay, worst case scenario, if I lose the fucking house and if I lose everything, I will be able to walk away and all of a sudden I won't have a giant fucking mortgage to pay every month. And that it will feel like I have more money, even though I've lost this hot, this huge thing that, and it's technically awful, but I, you know, I won't have a, this giant bill. And instead of paying however much I'm paying for a mortgage every month, I'll just be able to use that for food. And maybe I could relocate and Try again, you know, I'll, I'll be alive and that's okay. There are, there are, I feel like, um, yeah. And this is pro probably because I, you know, I don't know, man. Once you become a little older and you experience, <laughs> you see actual bad things happen and what, ha what happens to people, other people in your life when something actually bad happens, it really broadens your worldview of what a problem is. And stressing about money is like, it can be very stressful, but it's not the end of the world. You'll be all right. You're 21. You're not supposed to have money. It takes a really fucking long time. All right. I'm 30 years old. I'm turning 31 in January. And I still am like, all right, where's my next fucking paycheck coming from? I need to figure this out so I don't have to, 
you know, forego the electricity bill. All right, that shit, that shit happens. And I'm someone who everyone looks at and goes, fuck, look at all the views. He must have a million dollars, you know? And I'm, yeah, I'm all right. You'll be all right. It's fine, okay? You'll be sweet. Slow down. It takes a really long time. You're 21. You're young as fuck. You're going to look back at this and be like, why was I so stressed? It's fine. And if it's not fine, that's fine. All right? You, if you can buy food, if you can leave your house and walk around, you can figure out a way to be happy, okay? What do you actually need to be happy? Not much. If you really think about it, what do you actually need? Once you got your food and your shelter, what do you actually need? If you can't answer that question, you've got to figure it out. And I guarantee you it's not money. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening. I'm going to talk to you on Patreon. If you want to support the show, uh, you can do so on Patreon. Uh, you get early access to the podcast uh, and a bonus episode every single week, except for when my neck hurts so much that I couldn't talk. Um, I will talk to you next Sunday and I've got a video for you coming very soon uh, on the Lewis Spears channel. All right, have a shit one. Bye.